So nowadays, a lot of filmmakers like using camera lenses that have character. And at this point, it's pretty hard to even know exactly what that word means anymore because different people consider different things to be character. Could be stuff like chromatic aberration, sharpness fall off, lens reflection, diffusion effects, swirly backgrounds, flares, and a bunch of stuff like that. But in general, character is pretty much just like optical imperfections that might make your footage look a little bit more unique and cool without completely ruining it. But sometimes you might not want to have that stuff baked into your footage or you might just want to have a little bit more control over it. And that's when it could be a good idea to try and add those things in post. So in this video, I want to show you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about. All right, the first way that you could add some character to boring footage is by using the built-in resolve blur effects in combination with a simple mask. I've got a clip here with a really simple color grade, and then I've set up a new node after everything else. And now I'm going to go into the masking tab and I will make a circular mask. I'm also going to make it a bit bigger as well as a lot softer. And it's also a good idea to invert it now so that whatever we do to the node only affects the outer part of the mask and not me. Now we can look at the effects library and the blur effects that we're going to be talking about are right at the top. My personal favorites and the ones that I use the most are the Gaussian blur, the radial blur and the zoom blur. So we're going to start with those. So if we take the Gaussian blur and drop it onto the node with the mask, this is what that would look like to start off with. If I go full screen and turn it on and off, you can see that it's blurring just the edges of the image. This is kind of supposed to give that effect of using a lens that has sharpness fall off towards the edges, but obviously this effect is way too strong by default. So I can pull back the sliders to try to bring it closer to a more believable look. And this looks better to me. The edges are still blurry, but it doesn't look as obvious anymore. And because of that, it doesn't look as artificial. And you can also uncheck this box to unlink the vertical and horizontal blur. And that way you can control the direction of the blur. But if that's what you want to do, you are probably better off using the directional blur, which I'll show you in a bit. So I'm just going to get rid of this very quickly. And if we now go and use the radial blur instead, this is what that looks like. It's sort of similar to the Gaussian blur, but aside from blurring the edges, it also creates this slightly swirly effect, which is something that certain lenses out there do. But again, this effect is only being applied to the outside of the mask, but even then it's a bit too strong. So I usually pull down the strength and something like this looks a lot more natural and not as intrusive. You could have it be symmetrical, which is what I have it on most of the time, but you could also have it be clockwise or counterclockwise. And both of these could be cool depending on what type of look you're going for, but they're also gonna be a lot more stylized and obvious. So they're probably not something that you wanna use most of the time, but that's pretty much up to you. And then there is the zoom blur, and this one is also pretty cool. Again, the default intensity of it is probably too much for most situations, so it is good to pull it down. But keep in mind that with the zoom blur, you can go into negative numbers with the sliders. And that essentially means that positive values are going to push the blur out towards the edges, and the negative ones are going to start pulling the blur in towards the center. And if I just reset this zoom amount, you also have a slider for something that's called center exclusion, which does kind of the same thing as the mask that I've already got set up. And if you increase it, it basically just keeps the blur from affecting the middle of the frame, which in this case is me. So this could be useful in certain situations where whatever you have as a subject in your frame is in the middle of the shot. But there are also occasions where you probably don't need to use this and you would still be fine if you are just using a mask like the one that I have set up. It's also worth quickly talking about the directional blur that I mentioned a second ago, and it pretty much does what the name implies. It gives you a blur that you can control the direction of. So by using the blur angle, you can either have it be like more horizontal, more vertical. If you set it to 90 degrees, it's just pretty much going to go up and down. 
And again, you can control the strength of it to dial it in and make it look a little bit more believable. So this is also an effect that could look cool in certain situations as long as you don't go too overboard with it. And another alternative method that you can use to add some of the effects that I just showed you is with some of the plugins from Motion VFX, like for example, the M Style Cinematic plugin. In here, there is an effect called blurring, which is essentially like the built-in Gaussian blur from Resolve. And to use it, you would either drop it on your footage or what I prefer doing is putting an adjustment clip above the footage that I'm gonna be working with and then dropping it onto that. Right away, you're probably not gonna see it doing anything to your footage because there are these in and out animations that you need to uncheck. And now you're gonna notice that it's actually taking effect on the image. Aside from just the blurring effect, it's also combined with this grain that you can turn off if you prefer. And then you have a bunch of controls, like for example, how strong the blur is, what the shape of the blur is gonna be, where the center point of it is gonna be, as well as how big of an area it's gonna affect. And again, you've got the in and out animations in case you want it to just like appear and disappear at a certain point of the video. And then aside from that, you also have this M style cinematic anamorphic effect. Again, you drop this on an adjustment layer above your footage and it's gonna be kind of similar to the radial blur, but it's also got a few other things going on. So to see what's going on, we have to first turn off the in and out animations just to straight up get the effect without having to wait for it to animate in. And something else that it's got going on except for this radial blur effect is that it distorts your footage and stretches it a bit because it is trying to imitate the anamorphic look, but I personally don't like that, so I usually just set that to zero, and this looks more normal, and it doesn't really like stretch out the footage and make it look weird. And then you can use this control wheel to dial in the strength to make it look more believable, and this is pretty much how you would dial in the look. And there is one more thing in here, which is the next effect that I wanted to talk about, and that is going to be the Resolve Prism Blur effect, which is essentially an RGB split. And you can straight up just drop this onto your footage, but that's obviously going to affect everything and you might not want that. So instead, you could also use that with a mask like the one that we set up a second ago. And that way you can isolate it to specific parts of your image. Right off the bat, this is also a pretty heavy handed effect. So if I decide to use it, I usually pull down the blur strength as well as the aberration distance and the aberration strength. That kind of brings it to a point where it looks a little bit less intrusive. Like you can still see that it is affecting the edges of certain things in the frame but it's nowhere near as strong as it is by default. And this RGB split thing is part of a few of the effects in that M style cinematic plugin. But another way to get that same effect would be using this free plugin from Motion VFX, which is called M Cam Rig. And again, I am going to add an adjustment clip above my footage, and then I'm gonna drop it onto that. And to start, nothing is going on because we have these in and out animations again, which I am going to turn off. And this plugin is usually meant for a different use case where you would animate screenshots and stills while also making them a bit more interesting with a few of the available effects. But one of those effects is exactly a prism blur. And if you go and you uncheck all of these other effects and you also go into the camera controls and set the zoom to zero, you could just use the prism blur effect in here on its own. It gives you a similar effect to what you could do with the built-in resolve one, but just with a different way of controlling it. And this one is more simplified. So you could decrease the prism blur, increase the aberration distance and decrease the strength, but really all of these are up to preference. And then by using the in and out animations, you can make it so that it animates in and out whenever you need it to. And you can have it happen not only as a visual thing, but also like a narrative beat as well. Another built-in resolve effect that I think can give you some pretty cool results is called lens reflections. And it's all the way down here under resolve FX light. And the amount of control that this gives you is actually pretty decent, but it could end up even being a little bit overwhelming because chances are you won't exactly be sure what you should change and what you should just leave alone. But you can mess around with it a lot to get it looking pretty realistic. 
the shapes of the different flares that it's going to give you, the defocus type, the stretch, the position in the actual frame, the intensity and the color based on the lens coating and so on. And it seems to do a pretty good job at recognizing light sources and giving you flares and reflections that look like they were part of the footage in the first place. Like in this example clip, you don't see any lens reflections at the start, but as the camera moves and it reveals something that looks like a more obvious light source behind, the lens flares start showing up. And then if we keep moving forward in the clip, they just get more intense. Now, obviously I realize that this is a very, very strong effect. So if I wanted to make it a bit less noticeable, I could go into the global blend and just bring that down a bit. And now it actually looks kind of realistic. You have a light source on the left here, and then you've got the reflection on the right. And if I turn it off, you can see that it kind of looks like it's really supposed to be there. I could tweak it a bit more because you can see this kind of bluish violet color, which doesn't really make sense in the context of this specific clip. And in this case, it would be here under the reflecting element three, which is this color. So I can change it to something that's more orange or I guess more yellow, probably something in between. Maybe it's still a bit strong, so I would bring down the global blend. But again, if I turn it off, this is what it looks like without it. And then if I turn it on, this is what it looks like with it. And if we move to a different part of the clip, you can see that it dynamically changes based on how much of this light source we can actually see in the clip itself. So when we can barely see the light source or we can't see it at all, there is no lens flare at all. And then again, you have an effect in the M style cinematic plugin from Motion VFX that can also give you reflections and lens flares that you can control. And it's this M style cinematic flare. So again, I would add an adjustment clip above my footage, and then I'm gonna drop it onto that adjustment clip. And it gives you a lot of different controls over the way that it looks. And unlike with the built-in resolve one, this effect doesn't really recognize when a light source is in the frame. So you might actually be better off using the in and out animations that it comes with. And you can also change the duration of the adjustment clip to kind of determine when it's going to show up in the clip itself. So let's say I wanted to appear when we start seeing the light source like we did with the example with the built-in resolve effect. I'm gonna move the playhead to a point where we can clearly see that light source. And then I'm gonna move the adjustment clip kind of further along to match that. I'm also gonna extend it all the way to the end of the clip. And as you can see, it's very subtle here at the start because we have this in animation checkbox ticked. So if I remove that, it is a lot more noticeable. Also, again, you have this built-in grain, which I'm just gonna turn off. And then we can go back to the controls for the flares. So I can make the flare a little bit smaller, but I can also change the type of it. So there are two flares within this effect. Flare one is gonna be this bigger one here. And then flare two is gonna be this smaller element here, which isn't as visible in this example. But each of these have several different versions that you can go through. So I can make flare one be the version 10. And this looks a lot more believable than the one that it gave us by default, which looked a lot more like an anamorphic flare, which doesn't make sense in this case. So I can then go and make this more orange to match our light source in the back. And then I can do the same thing for flare two. I'm gonna go ahead and change this to flare 10 again. And as you can see, that changes the shape of the flare, which is this one here in the middle. Again, I can change the color of this one as well. So I am going to try and make it a bit bluer to match what we have in the corner here. And then if we move further along in the clip, again, this looks kind of believable. If I turn it off, this is what it looks like without it. This is what it looks like with it. So as long as you play around with all of these settings and the timing of the effect on the adjustment clip, you can get it to look pretty realistic and it can add something cool to your footage. So with each of these effects, there are different ways that you can go about creating them and getting good looking results. The motion VFX plugin method is a bit quicker, more convenient and more simplified in terms of the controls. And on the other hand, the built-in resolve effects will give you more control and flexibility, but some of them might take more time to set up correctly and to make them look good. In general, it is just slightly different workflows to get similar results, but it really depends on which one fits your needs better. So all of what I just showed you isn't gonna be a one size fits all solution. There will be moments when it doesn't make sense to use any of these techniques at all. But then again, if you are going for something a little bit more stylized and you wanna give footage that would otherwise be 
pretty clean some character, then these could be a good way to go about it. Of course, there will always be a place in people's workflows for lenses that already have character built in, but if the one you're using doesn't, then it is very possible to just do it in post.